Well, I wanted to ask you about um, the the comparison between what Russia is doing and what Israel is doing, because that's something you had said when we emailed that you mm -hmm. wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, the comparisons are instructive because in both cases, an, illeg an illegal war was launched. It ended, the first phase ended with an occupation and then the occupation mutated into an annexation. So there's very little at the level of the surface that distinguishes what happened in Israel in 1967 and what happened in Ukraine in, 20, in this past February. However, I think there is one critical difference. As you know, I have said from day one, I'm the only one to my knowledge has said it, I'm not sure if it's either a good thing or a bad thing. I have been from, of the opinion from day one that Russia had the right to attack Ukraine. Now, a distinction has to be made between having the right and whether it was a wise thing to do. There are many rights we all have, but they may be on prudential grounds, not a particularly smart thing to do. I, not being a diplomat or a military expert, I can't say. I can't even say now. Anyone who thinks they know what's going on in the war in the Ukraine is just talking out of his or her behind. Nobody knows. It's all propaganda on all sides about what's actually happening with these offensives, defensives. Nobody knows. I follow it very closely, and I freely admit, after following it with an eagle's eye, I haven't a clue what's going on. So I can't say if it was pr wise or not, prudent or not. I'm not going to go there. I say they have the right. Now, the difference between the Israel situation and the Russia situation, apart from the news coverage, which of course is bonkers, um, the difference is Russia for 30 years, beginning with Gorbachev, had been sounding the alarm about NATO expansion and did everything humanly possible, making perfectly reasonable offers to resolve the conflict, namely the neutralization of Ukraine to belong neither to an Eastern Bloc or a Western Bloc, and the implementation of what was called Minsk II, basically to give local minority rights to the Russian-speaking people of the Ukraine. That's the essence of it. it, hasn't really changed at all. And all of those efforts to reach a reasonable negotiated settlement of the conflict were systematically uh, rebuffed by the Ukraine to the extent they had any say, but rebuffed by the United States and NATO. So, the question which begs for an answer, there are a thousand and one people, a thousand and one people nowadays who will say, yes, it's true, Russia was provoked. Yes, it's true, NATO expansion was wrong. Yes, it's true that Russia put forth this offer and that offer. But then they say, but what Russia did was criminal. No, like Aaron Mate, my yeah. co-host. Well, I, I don't want to name No, names. it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. He'd be fine yeah. with me saying I that. Think, I think the world of, uh, of Aaron, and I, I don't want to drag I've said in. that too, basically. Yeah, uh, but I want to hear so, your opinion. Yeah. So the question then becomes, what was Russia supposed to do? If you think they were provoked, if you think they were being reasonable, if you think they were, being, they were constantly being rebuffed, what were they supposed to do? Was it... Was, was uh, Russia obliged, I don't say Putin because that's a complete lie, the entire ruling elite in Russia agrees on this issue, that Ukraine was a red line. Ukraine and Georgia were red lines. It's not Putin. 
It's the whole Russian ruling elite. And so the question is, was Russia obliged to accept a nuclear-tipped missiles on its border in a government and an armed forces filled with Nazis and aligned with a hostile uh, military bloc? Were they obliged to accept that? That's the question. And I haven't seen anybody who squarely faces that question. Was That's where things were headed. At this point, Russia, uh, Ukraine was de facto a member of NATO. NATO officers were training its army. NATO was supplying the weapons to Ukraine. NATO was engaging in joint military exercises with Ukraine. All that remained was stationing nuclear-tipped missiles on the border with Russia. Were they obliged to accept that fait accompli? My answer is no. I can give you a long reason why my answer is no, but my answer is no. If you want to hear me out another time, I'm happy to go through it. All right. But... Here's the difference with Israel. I want a preview of it, maybe. The Arabs wanted to settle with Israel before 67. There were many attempts made, even in May 1967. The UN Secretary General Utant recommended a moratorium for two weeks in order to calm things down. Israel rejected it. Nasser, the head, of, the head of state of Egypt, offered to take the issue of the blockade in the Straits of Tehran. Most of you readers, well, listeners won't know it. I'm giving you the technical details for those who do remember. Nasser offered to take the issue of the blockade of the Straits of Tehran to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. There were many reasonable, reasonable offers made on the Arab side to settle at least the issues that arose in May, June, 1967, May, 1967. Israel rejected all of them. On the other hand, Russia made all the reasonable offers and it was Ukraine to the extent that Ukraine is an independent entity. It was the US and NATO who rejected all the offers. So on balance, I would much rather be defending the Russian case for attacking Ukraine in a court of law. I would be much happier and much more confident defending Russia in a court of law regarding its attack on Ukraine rather than defending Israel in a court of law regarding its attack that climax in the occupation of Egypt Syria and the West Bank and Gaza. Hmm. Wow. And you, um, you just said uh, you could, you'd get into at another time why you think Russia has the right to do it. Could you give us like a little preview or a okay. little mini summary? Or yeah, I'm, I'm going to backtrack. I, I, I'm going to sidestep it and get to it. I'll take okay. a, a, a diversion. The Jews suffered the loss of five to six million Jews during World War II, a colossal tragedy for Jews and for humanity, okay? After World War II, the issue came up of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine. And I've studied that era a lot, you know, that's my life, that was my, that was my life. Of all the speeches that were given at the UN, the most moving speech by a large margin, a most moving speech by a large margin, a wide margin, was Gromyko's speech, the foreign minister of the UK. Excuse me, the foreign minister of the USSR. Mm. Okay. It's an interesting name for a Brit. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, well, Liz Trust isn't exactly a great name either. No. Um, so, uh, and in his speech, it still moves me. It still moves me because 
Russia lost about, the estimates are about 27 million people during World War II. There wasn't a single family where a family member wasn't killed during World War II. And Gromyko said that the suffering of the Jews was special. Coming from a Russian that was the most un and you know, a battle hardened Russian, you know, this is Stalin's foreign minister. Yeah. We're not talking about uh, a, 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 um, uh, a snowflake, okay? And but a Russian foreign minister, and he said, if, if they can't resolve the conflict, meaning the Arabs and Jews in Palestine, then given the magnitude of the suffering that Jews suffered during World War II, Russia was going to support the founding of a Jewish state. It was an absolutely incredible moment because the Cold War had begun and the US and USSR found themselves on the same side. There was never a case like that again. But I'm sure there was a lot of real politique involved and you could come up with 10,000 arguments about the Russians want to expel the British from uh, the Middle East and so they support the Israel in order to get the British out. Yes, there's a lot of real politique, but there was something in my opinion, and you can call me naive and you can call me, you know, a red diaper vapor and all, baby and all that stuff, but there was something genuine there. There was something genuine, in my opinion, there was something genuine there. My parents loved the Russian people, loved the Russian people. Why? Because they, they liberated. Felt, not just the liberation, they felt the Russian people understood war. Mm. They felt that the nearest analog to what they experienced during World War II was what the Russian people experienced during World War II. So, why do I bring it up? Because supporting a Jewish state was obviously a violation of the rights of self-determination of the Arab people. It was. But I felt Gromyko made a compelling case why maybe in this instance that right should not be fully granted. Now we can disagree on that, but I felt he made a case there. Now, Russia lost about- Sorry, what was the, he made, which, 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 what was the case that he made? That to accept the violation of the basic right of self-determination of the Palestinian people in the whole of Palestine, by supporting the creation in part of Palestine of a Jewish state. He's right. He was saying that that was justifiable. He said if they couldn't get along, if we exhaust all possibilities of trying to work out a mutually agreeable settlement, then he was going to support the founding of a Jewish state. Okay. Now, in my opinion, Russia earned the historic right not to have nuclear missiles poised on its border, armed in no small part by Nazis, and aligned with a hostile military bloc. How did they earn it? Well, first of all, I think I can give you 27 million reasons. 20 Seven million. Do you know how many Americans died during World War II? You watch American movies, 200,000. You know how many Brits? Everybody talks about the, you know, the Battle of Britain, the, ba the Battle of Britain, you know, the, uh, over London, the bombing of London, 400,000. Do you know how many Russians died just in the siege of Leningrad? You know how many Russians died in 800 days? over a million that means twice twice 
the total number of Americans and Brits who died in the whole of World War II. Does Russia, is now Russia obliged to have an army rife with Nazis on its border with nuclear tip missiles and armed by a hostile military bloc? Are they obliged? My answer is no. You can talk to me about the letter of the law till the end of time. And maybe under that letter of the law, I will grant you, I will grant you, under that letter of the law, the invasion was illegal. I will grant that. You know, lawyers can turn black. You know, the whole point of being a lawyer is trying to prove the black is white, up is down. That's what law is. Law is trying to prove that A is actually non-A. That's law. I won't play those games. I could sit down and play those games with you. I know the law well enough. I could play those games. I won't do it. Okay? I'm not going to do it. I'll grant that under international law, it was the crime of aggression. But in my opinion, just as Gromyko said that the Jews had a historic right to a state based on the suffering they endured during World War II, that catastrophic suffering they endured, a, a, a right to sell a right to a state which did, honest to speak honestly, trample on the right of self-determination of the Palestinians in the whole of Palestine. Now let me be clear, when the when the Russians said you had a right to a state, it didn't say you had a right to expel the indigenous population from that state. So that's a separate issue. In my opinion, it's these are discrete issues. Right. They didn't they never said that, but they said the Jews had a right to a state. Okay? So just as I will accept that the catastrophic suffering of the Jewish people may have endowed it with a historic right to a state, then in the same way the historic suffering of the Russian people during World War II endows it with the right not to have that Ukrainian state aligned with NATO, filled with Nazis and armed with nuclear weapons on its border. That's how I see it. And I'm not going to, as Lillian Hellman famously said in the 1950s during the McCarthy era, she said, I'm not going to cut my cloth to fit this year's fashions. And I'm not doing it either. I would consider it a complete betrayal of my parents' legacy and what they imparted to me. It is true, you could say, Putin's a thug, of course. Putin's a murderer, of course. Not going to in any way take away, you know, Ignore that. Whether any American head of state is any better, I don't know. I yeah. I, no. I got it. Uh, all of that is true. I'll leave on one last note because I have to work my stupid book. Okay. Uh, I'm going to leave on one last note. I was recently reading a collection of Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionist, his writings before the rise and at, at the time of the rise of fascism and just on the eve of World War II. He was murdered in 1940. And he said something to me that was very striking. Well, he said many things that were very striking. You know, he was uh, he was an enormous mind, and in politics he was unequaled. He was he was in the class all his own in political analysis. Nobody even came near him. Um, but he said Stalin, who of course was his nemesis, who killed him in the end. He said Stalin. I'm quoting him now. Was the most conservative leader in Europe. Why was he so conservative? Because he said he was so weak militarily, economically. He, was, he had a regime that was so repressive, that he was so unpopular, and he was afraid that any little jolt may cause the whole regime to collapse. And it struck me, 
Nobody's going to say any, make any saving graces for Stalin. Brutal murderer, tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold worse than Putin. Okay, but he was also very conservative on the international stage. And I think that's exactly the same with Putin. He's very weak. He knows it. He, look, he was the head of the KGB. He knows how weak that regime is. The very thing, the very last thing that he wants is to engage in conflicts that might rock the boat and cause the whole regime to cave in. So you could say all you want about Putin's evil. I'm not going to get into a tit for tat with you on that question. But I think on this basic issue, he was actually very conservative. Yeah. He just, he just wanted to resolve it in such a way that he himself would not be left vulnerable on the domestic scene to the fact that he let NATO station nuclear tip missiles on his border. Otherwise, he was completely reasonable. The internal regime is a nightmare. Yeah, I'm sure it is, just like Stalin's was. But well, I, I was making my leading question, just to clarify quickly. Well, do you want to finish your thought? Or Yes, I said okay. your previous guest, you know, everybody's talking about how horrible Putin is. Yes, it's all, it all may be true. But I think on the international stage, because he's perfectly well aware of how weak he is, right. He's actually a conservative force. Yeah. And that's what stood out for me in reading Trotsky. He said, Yeah. He said Stalin is the most conservative leader in Europe because he knows how weak his regime is. Yeah. I actually, my leading question for Bronco for the first guest, I was, I thought I was like a teacher who tries to ask that question and wants their student to, an to answer it a certain way. And he didn't really <laughs> surprise me. But my point is that say what you will about Putin. It's a mo it's, it, it doesn't matter. Almost. The point is you want to end the war or not end the war. And this presentation of Putin as a Hitler is just so that people can then lean into this narrative of it's, it's appeasement to negotiate with him. Um, yes, I, I agree with that. Yeah. But, um, well, we're going to have, <laughs> yeah. The question is what was wrong with the terms of the settlement he proposed? Austria, right. Austria was demilitarized after world war two. Nobody right. had any problem with that. Probably was to the, you know, it was to the, it's a funny thing when leftists are appalled at the idea of neutralizing the state, or I think that's a good thing actually, if you're a person of the left. And everyone says, well, um, uh, Ukraine is independent. It has the right to choose what it wants. Well, frankly, it's not independent now. Zelensky's just a puppet for the West. He won last five minutes of American weapons weren't pouring in. He does whatever the Americans want him to do. There was a very funny headline in the New York Times a few days ago, maybe three or four days ago. The headline was, the United States prepares for long war in the Ukraine. I had to laugh. That is really funny. I, I'm thinking to myself, wait, isn't that something the Ukrainians are supposed to decide? Right, right. Whether yeah. it's going to be a long war? Wow. The U.S. prepares for a long war in the Ukraine. It's incorrect to even call it a proxy war. It's not a proxy war. It's a U.S. is a U.S. Russian war, and it happens to be fought on the U.S. side by Ukrainians. That doesn't change anything. You're way too young to remember back in 1968. Uh, President Nixon, he ran on the platform, it was called, he didn't actually say it, but we're not going to get bogged down in the technicalities, uh, uh, what was called a secret plan for peace. He right. got elected, and what was his secret plan for peace? It was called Vietnamization, that they were going to gradually phase out American troops and replace them with Vietnamese troops. But of course, the United States is going to be calling all the shots. It's just going to be fought by Vietnamese troops. So... Uh, the same principle applies here. There's no Ukrainian-Russian war. There's a U.S. Ukrainian U.S. Russia war, in which our troops happen to be Ukrainian, and not all of them are Ukrainian. But that's a separate question. All right. Well, we'll have to have you back on to answer another question, another point, because I'm curious about your justification of a certain type of Israeli state versus another type of Israeli state. So we'll have to make another appointment because I know you've been very generous with your time. You have to work on your your I, I wanted, I wanted, I have to answer that. 
Oh, okay. You know, I have to work on this idiotic book. Um, I said, let me answer it in a different way. When I was a little bit dogmatic on the Israel-Palestine conflict, and my, my mother cautioned me about that because my mother and father, they hated Israel, but they hated Israel because Israel was aligned with the U.S. against the Soviet Union during the Cold War after the Korean War. But they sometimes felt that I went overboard. And they cautioned me because they were very, they were absolutely atheist, absolutely secular, but also totally Jewish. And survived the Holocaust. Yeah. And they they cautioned me about going too far and approaching the self-hating Jew thing, you know, and I, I, I took that to heart. You know, I, I, I respected their moral judgment. I had to listen. I had to listen. Once I was in having an argument with my mother and I said, my mother always said, Jews need a refuge. Jews need a refuge because when the moment of truth came, nobody wanted us. So Jews needed a refuge. So I said, but mom, if Jews have their own state, what does that mean about the Palestinians that live in that state? And at that point, she just said, go away from me. She didn't want to think about it. She knew there was obviously a problem there, a contradiction there, but she didn't know in her own mind, and she was extremely smart, how to reconcile it, how to reconcile her historic experience that Jews needed a refuge, how to reconcile that with doesn't a refuge for the Jews mean that everybody else who's not Jewish will end up either being a second class citizen or just outright expelled. So I said, that what Gromyko spoke to was the right of the Jews, based on their historic experience during World War II, to have a place of refuge, a state. But he didn't then go to that next question, which is the one I put to my mother, then what does that mean for the non-Jews who were living in that Jewish state? I think that's a very tough question, but I still, on that first part, that after that historic experience, it kind of might be construed as trumping the right of self-determination, at least in part of Palestine. So my point, and I'll leave it at that, is you can say there exists a fundamental international law prohibiting aggression and Russia broke it. You can say there is a fundamental international law guaranteeing the people indigenous to an area the right of self-determination and the Zionists broke it, okay? with the support of Russia, the critical support of Russia at that particular moment, because if Russia had lined up against it, it wasn't clear whether it would pass the secure, the General Assembly. It wasn't clear whether the resolution would pass the General Assembly. Uh, uh, but in both cases, I can see, so when your listeners start attacking me, I could see circumstances in which a historical experience can trump a legal right. I can see that. Where a historical experience, be it of the Jews during World War II or the Russian people during World War II, where that historic experience can trump even a fundamental tenet or a tenet of international law. I can see that. So you can tell me it was illegal, you can tell me it was an act of aggression, and I still say, on the basis of that historical experience, they had the right. Sorry, it's muted. So you think Israel had the right to create a nation? 
in 48? Israel at that point, does, I think it's very hard to separate out the creation of the state from the ideology that underpinned that objective. And the ideology that underpinned it, I think, cannot be justified. As Benny Morris was Israel's leading historian for a long time, uh, as he wrote in his book, the vastly expanded book on the Palestinian refugees, it's this huge volume, right. he says, the idea of transfer, expulsion, the idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. That's what he writes. It's inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. So the question then becomes whether with a different ideology, not the ideology of Zionism, but with a different ideology, might it have, might it have been possible to create that Jewish refuge, but still create a place for the Jews there? That's as you, as you can as you are perfectly able to grasp. That is such an abstract question, because history is what history is. It's water under the bridge. I am only saying that I can see occasions where historical experience trumps the law. That's all I'm saying. I'm mm -hmm. not denying i could play the games you know putin said well the uh the regents in the donbass they, they declared their uh independence and we came to their aid when they were, you know he has all these technical arguments which this is what every international lawyer does he didn't do anything which any other international law but i don't want to play that game i don't i'll say yeah it broke the law I have right no I, but I guess my question is whether you think it's morally justifiable. It seems like in the Russian case, no, you I, do. I, don't, I don't think you can make an argument for the expulsion of the people. Now, how you would have handled it, I think it's a tough question. I think it's a tough question. And why can't we sometimes just acknowledge these are tough questions? Mm -hmm. right. You know? Uh, but no, I, I don't think anything to just. Uh, you know, the Zionist movement itself never believed it could justify what it did. You know how you know that? Because for the longest time, they kept saying the place was empty. Right. Because a people without a land, land without a people. Yeah, because they understood if there were people there, what they were doing couldn't be legitimate. That's why they kept saying it was empty. And then in 1948, they kept saying, well, the Arabs left because of the Arab radio broadcasts. Now, of course, those broadcasts never happened. But... By insisting that the land was empty and then insisting that the Arabs left of their own volition, what they're in effect saying is, if the land had not been empty and if what the Arabs, and if the Arabs did not flee of their own volition, then what Israel did was wrong. So the Israeli propaganda is a backhanded admission that they themselves know what they did was wrong. Right. Wow. Well, final word I have to ask you, final question I have to ask you. Someone in the comments wrote, Piss, ps, you know, PSST, if you're not, if you're secular and atheist, you're not Jewish or you're not a Jew. That, what say ye? I think that's ridiculous. If I went to that's went, a Michigas. If I went uh, before a group of people and I announced I'm not Jewish, <laughs> Finkelstein, yeah, your gestures, yeah. your intonations, you're like Woody Allen, and you're not Jewish. That's like when they said Bernie was hiding it. It's like where yeah. is he hiding it? How can he hide it? From whom? Exactly. Yeah. Hiding it. Yeah, it's a stupid thing to say. So. Uh, you know, as Hannah Arendt put it, she says, being Jewish is one of the objective givens of my life. 
And then the question is what you choose to do with that fact. Right. But it's an objective given, you know? So and I, to deny it is as if to say there's something you would, you're ashamed of. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It just is. And then right. the question is what you make of that datum, what right. you do with it, you know? So. Uh, yeah, we'll do another show on that. Because I think no, some people don't understand uh, that question. But yeah. I think too much Jewish navel gazing is. No, uh, I don't think it's navel gazing. I think it's a, it's actually important because I think, well, whatever. We can get into another time. You know, but there, I was, think there, important... was there was a t-shirt in the 1960s, war is not healthy for human beings and other living things. Yeah. Well, I agree. It's also Jewish navel gazing. Right. It's not healthy for human beings and other living things. There are other, believe it or not, there are other, there are of course. Some, there are some other people. No, the, of course, but I actually think it's important that people understand that being Jewish doesn't mean being religious. Yeah, I, whole, I know. You know, I, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. When uh, in the 1980s, I think there was a spoof of the New York Post, and the, it was called not in very small letters not and then the big letters the new york post and the headline was uh michael jackson comma 40 million others die in nuclear holocaust <laughs> that's funny yeah and then there's a letter in the to the editor by Eli wiesel and he says i reject Oh my God! Describe that as a, no, it was a spoof. It was a spoof. Oh, right. but the spoof was a, was the Ellie was was a spoof too. Yeah. It was a, oh, it was I get it. That spoof. is funny. How yeah. dare you call that a holocaust? That is funny. <laughs> so I'm a little uh, I'm a little jaundiced when it comes to Jewish right. noble gazing. Right. Well, thank you so much. And when is your book coming out? Uh, hopefully by December. I'm I'm on the second round of the typeset version. Oh great! And this is the can't the blowing it up. Uh, let it burn. No, no, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. Oh, yeah, nice. Just like I just burned some bridges on your show. Yeah, another day, <laughs> another bridge burned. Believe me, I don't do it with any glee, and without I don't do it, you know, trying to get shares, views, Clicks, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but yeah, um, I think you know it's a basic faithfulness to truth that um, you should, uh, you know, there's a German folk song, Die Gedanken sind frei, thoughts are free. My thoughts will not cater to Duke nor dictator. No one can deny Die Gedanken sind frei. I'm not going to be irresponsible in my words. I'm gonna think through what I have to say. But if those are the conclusions I reach, I'm not going to shy away from saying them. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Bye okay. Bye. Thanks, Norman. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you are watching this live, you're in luck. You get to see this whole thing um, for free. And if you're watching this later uh, and you want to see the full chat with Norman, then please go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show patreon.com slash the Katie helper show. I also want to just share two comments that I think may be by the same person and it may be from a troll. I'm not sure, but this is a point worth responding to. I don't like to highlight the hate and these people did not donate, but I'm still going to read it because I, I want to respond to it. So one of them is that one of them writes, Katie seems to at least understand some of Norman's points. She wanted to be the big martyr for getting fired from the Hill what organizing has she ever done or even attending? So you meant attended, not attending. So hold for that. We'll hold that comment. Um, then another one says, Katie seems like, this is why I think it's the same person. Katie seems like a nice person, but she wasn't canceled. She was a contributor to a right-wing show and she ran into a predictable right-wing buzzsaw. Okay, what organizing have I done? First of all, I don't claim to be an organizer. I did do labor organizing when I was in college and a bit afterwards, but that's neither here nor there. You could say none and it wouldn't undermine my claim with the Hill. I didn't say I got canceled by the Hill as an organizer. I didn't say I got canceled by the Hill for my organizing. I said I got canceled, censored and fired by the Hill for writing and then recording a monologue laying out why Israel is an apartheid state. 
Now, as for the claim that I was, this was predictable, um, I want to be a big martyr, or that uh, it was a right-wing show and she ran into a predictable right-wing buzzsaw, yeah, that would be the truth if I hadn't done dozens of segments criticizing Israel in the past. So I did a segment on uh, Shireen Abu Akleh. I did a segment on uh, Israel lying about killing her. I did a segment on Israel lying about who is responsible for bombing a cemetery. I did a segment on uh, Fox News's discussion of Israel-Palestine. So you are either ignorant or a liar and or projecting your own rank opportunism onto me. I did not think I'd be fired for talking about a subject that I had spoken about on many different occasions. So I just wanted to respond to that because even some, that is something that some people are saying. And uh, I actually think even some people who are in good faith think that, but it happens not to be the case. Now I get why you think that because there is so much censorship around Israel-Palestine that maybe it seems like my even bringing that up was being provocative. But the truth is, I was not like coming in, burning it all to the ground. I felt very, I thought there'd be people responding critically. I thought some of these outfits that spend their entire time like scouring the internets, trying to find anything critical of Israel would complain. I thought maybe they do a letter writing campaign, all of that. But I did not think that the Hill, the place where I had criticized Israel, on several occasions, uh, I did not think that they were going to fire me. So, um, yeah, let's see. Brad, what does Brad say? Brad says, I can assure anyone who's wondering, Katie did not want that fallout to occur. I can say that with 100% certainty. Yeah, because he spoke to me while we were while I was going through it. So, um, again, it's one thing if you assume that, but if you're doing, you're saying that to me as an own, it just shows that you're either ignorant. You know what I hate? There needs to be a word for this combination of people who are who are condescending while embarrassingly stupid. That I find very frustrating. Um, and yeah, I know people are telling me I don't need to respond to these kinds of comments. It's my, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, just say it. I think it's, it's a worthy thing to respond to because, again, a lot of people thought that I was, even like supporters of mine thought I did that. And it's just a, a point of fact, not what happened. Some of my supporters think I did it to like prove a point, which would have been, I mean, I wouldn't have done that, but that there's, that's something you could certainly justifiable thing if you want to do like a, I wouldn't judge anyone for doing a kind of PR stunt where they go in somewhere, they, they make a very reasoned argument about why Israel is an apartheid state and they get fired. Anyway, I could get how someone would do that intentionally to prove a good point, but that's not what happened. I was in, I thought, a place where I could say stuff like this. All right. So anyway, any other questions? Okay, we're going to, um, we are going to uh, go to Colin right now, and I will take your calls. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. And again, um, uh, if you are watching this live, you get to see the whole thing. If you're watching it later, you want to see some very spicy, interesting takes and awkward moments, then go to patreon.com slash the Katie Halper show. Thank you, Phantom Misfanta. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Brad. See you guys next week. Oh, and look out because I'm going to at some point soon do a special daytime stream on a Sunday because I want to have on people from uh, who are in Palestine and they can't do it at this time because that would be very, 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 very late for them. So I think the best time to do a daytime uh, stream for my, uh, for you guys, for all of us, would be a Sunday, right? So we'll do it on a Sunday. So uh, I'll put it out uh, if we're doing it. You'll get, a, I guess, a notification. Um, okay. Bye, everyone. Okay, I'm down. Whatever, man. Whatever, man.